Good morning. Uh, when I was in the fourth grade, I went to a school called Half Dollar Elementary School in the booming metropolis of Half Dollar, West Virginia. And my fourth grade teacher was a woman named Mrs. Baird. And no offense to any teachers in the audience, but Mrs. Baird was the single greatest teacher that ever lived. And this is why. Our entire fourth grade year, she never once yelled at us. She never raised her voice. Instead, the very first day of school, she walked into the classroom. We had two chalkboards in our classroom, big green chalkboards, one way at the front of the classroom, one in the back of the classroom. And the very first day of school, Mrs. Baird walked into the classroom. She went to that back chalkboard. She took a piece of yellow chalk, and she wrote each student's name on the board. And if you ever did anything wrong, she wouldn't holler at you. She would just walk to the back of the classroom, pick up a piece of purple chalk, and make a mark beside your name. Clearly, this was in the days before privacy laws. <laughs> and if you could go all week and get three or fewer marks beside your name, you got a lollipop at the end of the week. And we worked hard for those lollipops. I can tell you that my entire fourth grade career, I got three. <laughs> and one of those I was sick four days that week. <laughs> About the only person who consistently got a lollipop was a little girl named Alicia Snitch. <laughs> it was a terribly unfortunate name. And Alicia had gotten so many lollipops our fourth grade year that she was going to need dentures long before she needed braces. But even though we loved Mrs. Baird so much, we had one problem, one nagging suspicion, and this is what it was. When I was in the fourth grade, there was a television show called Wonder Woman with live actors and actresses. And the actress who played Wonder Woman was a lady named, oh my goodness, Linda Carter. Right, thank you. Whew. The actress who played Wonder Woman was a lady named Linda Carter, and my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Baird, looked exactly like Linda Carter. Well, we were fourth graders, and uh, we are not as sophisticated as fourth graders are today. We didn't know where to draw the line between fact and fantasy. And so we thought if our teacher looked like Linda Carter, and Linda Carter played Wonder Woman on television, we jumped to the logical conclusion that our teacher was Wonder Woman. And we decided it was our responsibility to force her to reveal herself. Now, we knew we couldn't just go up and ask her, right? We couldn't just walk up and be like, um, excuse me, Mrs. Baird, um, are you Wonder Woman? Because if she were a superhero, she'd have been too smart for that. She'd have said no. Now, everybody in the whole class thought she was Wonder Woman except Alicia Snitch, and we knew we had to come up with some way of exposing Mrs. Baird, but we would go in the lunchroom, and we would have these really deep intellectual arguments, really deep intellectual fourth grade arguments. I would say something really profound to Alicia Snitch, like, I propose the theory that Mrs. Baird is, in fact, Wonder Woman. And then Alicia would say something really intelligent back, like, uh-uh. To which I would naturally reply, uh-huh. And these arguments would go on for the whole lunch period. Well, we were in there one day, and my buddy Wally came running in. Now, Wally was sort of the brains of the operation, which isn't saying much. But <laughs> Wally came in, he's like, I got it, I know it, I figured it out. I said, lay it on me. He said, I know how Mrs. Baird is Wonder Woman. I said, let me have it. He said, think about it. He said, the president of the United States of America is Jimmy Carter. I said, uh-huh. He said, Linda Carter is Wonder Woman. I said, uh-huh. He said, they have the same last name. They must be related. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, maybe Wonder Woman is the president's mother. And Skeeter was like, no, 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 maybe it's his daughter. And Wally was like, no, 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 maybe it's his wife. 
He said, think about it. If you were the president of the United States of America and your wife was a superhero, we wouldn't need an army. If there was trouble in South America or the Middle East, you could just send your wife to take care of it. And Skeeter, who had grown up in a predominantly Republican household, said, so that's how Jimmy Carter got elected president. <laughs> but Alicia said, why would the wife of the president of the United States of America be teaching fourth grade at Half Dollar Elementary School? And I said, maybe to protect her identity. And Skeeter said, maybe there's some evil afoot. And Wally said, maybe the third graders are an alien army. I think you know what I'm talking about. We turned around to look at the third grade lunch table and about half the boys were back there. They were making baboon arms like this. They had carrots up their noses. They were like, ooh, and we were like, yeah. So we decided what we were going to have to do is one of us was going to have to put ourselves in great peril. If one of us was about to die, Mrs. Baird would be forced to reveal herself as Wonder Woman to come and save us. So we went out on the playground and Skeeter volunteered. He went over to the monkey bars and he climbed up on the monkey bars and then he climbed like halfway across. And then he let go with one arm. So there he was, hanging, I don't know, maybe, maybe 18 inches off the ground. <laughs> Mortal peril. If he had fallen from that height, he could have twisted his ankle or skinned his knee. And we all started yelling, help, help, help. Now, Mrs. Baird, Mrs. Baird had turned around to talk to another teacher. Now, in the television show, Wonder Woman didn't dress like Wonder Woman all day long. She had a secret identity. She was Diana Prince, mild-mannered ambassador for the United States of America, which is how we figured she and the president had met in the first place. So during non-crisis times, she just wore normal ambassador clothing. She'd have on like a blouse and a skirt. And when she needed to become Wonder Woman, what she would do is she would throw her arms out like this, and then she would spin around in circles. And then there'd be a bright light, and her ambassador clothing would be gone, and she'd be standing there in that, in that. <laughs> well, you know what Wonder Woman wears. It was a, in the TV show, anyway, it was a modest one-piece red, white, and blue bathing suit. It had a big golden WW right here. She had calf-high boots, a golden rope, and a tiara, a crown like Miss America wears. It did not seem like very practical crime-fighting wear to me. <laughs> well, what do I know? And also, one of our buddy's older brothers told us that if you watched really close while she was spinning around, there was a split second when she had removed her ambassador clothing, <laughs> but had not yet put on her Wonder Woman clothing. It's not really germane to the story, but some people find it interesting. But anyway, we started yelling, help, help. And Mrs. Baird, who had turned around to talk to another teacher, went like this. And we went, ooh. And she started to spin around like this. And we were all like, ah. And she got about this far around. And she looked, and she saw Skeeter. And she said, well, Lordy, Skeeter, just let go. You'd be all right. Man. We were that close. <laughs> if she had spun just a few more degrees, there'd have been the bright light. She'd have turned into Wonder Woman. So now we had to come up with another plan. So we were back in the lunchroom, and I said, I think Mrs. Baird is Wonder Woman. And Alicia said, uh-uh. And I said, uh-huh. And then Wally came running in. I got it. I know it. I figured it out. I said, lay it on me. He said, think about it. He said, Metropolis. That's the city where the D.C. superheroes hang out. He said, Metropolis is a long way from Half Dollar, West Virginia. I said, uh-huh. He said, Wonder Woman might need to be able to get there at a moment's notice. I said, uh-huh. He said, therefore, she can't just drive her car to school every day. She'd never be able to get to Metropolis quick enough in a crisis. I said, uh-huh. He said, therefore, she must come to school every day in her invisible jet. And if she comes to school in her invisible jet, Wally said she must park it in the teacher's parking lot. 
Well, it made sense to us. And we thought since the invisible jet was invisible that it must be made out of really clean glass. So if you hit it with a pebble, it would go tink. And if you hit it with a large enough rock, it would shatter. And we thought if we could shatter the invisible jet, Mrs. Baird would be forced to assume that the Legion of Doom was rising up out of the woods. She'd spin around, turn into Wonder Woman, and come and save us. So the teacher's parking lot was right beside the playground. And every day during recess, we'd walk out to the edge of the playground. We'd be like, <laughs> we'd whistle. Because if you whistle, nobody knows you're up to anything. And when we got to the edge of the playground, just very nonchalantly, we'd be like, and we'd pick up pebbles. And then very surreptitiously, we'd be like, Ugh. <laughs> and we would throw those pebbles into empty looking spaces in the teacher's parking lot. We were out there one day, and Wally threw a pebble, and it bounced off the asphalt and went into the woods. And we heard, tink. And Wally said, ooh, I think I just hit Wonder Woman's jet with a rock. And Alicia Snitch said, I think you hit a bottle. And Skeeter said, what would a bottle be doing in the woods? <laughs> and Alicia said, what would Wonder Woman's jet be doing in the woods? <laughs> and Skeeter said, maybe she's hiding it there. And Alicia said, why would she need to hide an invisible jet. <laughs> well, while we were having this argument over here, over here, unbeknownst to us, Wally had found a rock about the size and shape of an English muffin, and he had cupped it in his hand and was getting ready to go into the discus throw. Now, no offense to any fourth graders in the tent, but the rest of us know that there is not a fourth grader alive who can throw a discus in the direction he or she wants it to go. <laughs> we knew this. We were self-actualized. But Wally, Wally was living in some sort of fantasy world. And we saw him just as he started to come around with that giant rock. And our world went to slow motion. We were like, Wally, no. But it was too late. He let go of that giant rock, and it soared out over the teacher's parking lot higher and higher and higher. And Wally's momentum kept him spinning in circles. He lost his balance and went somersaulting across the ground. And we watched as that rock reached the apex of its flight, hung suspended in midair for a split second, and then started to descend. And it was like, whew, it was whistling. <laughs> so nobody would know what it was up to. Coming out of the sky. Gaining velocity as it fell, gaining mass as it gained velocity, coming down, 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 and then bam, it bounced off the hood of the principal's car. <laughs> Ricocheted off the headlight of another car and smashed through the window of a school bus. And there was a great rending of metal and a cacophony of crashing glass, and all of the teachers started to run over to see what had happened. And just as the teachers arrived, Wally, who had been rolling across the ground and had heard everything but hadn't seen anything, naturally assumed that he had smashed Wonder Woman's jet with a rock. <laughs> so just as the teachers arrived, Wally jumped up off the ground going, I did it! I did it! Well, the teachers just surrounded him. They said, Wally, what are you doing? And he said, I was trying to hit. And then he thought about it. And he said, I was, um, I was, uh, I was, uh, trying to hit Wonder Woman's jet with a rock. Well, fortunately, they had not yet invented the school psychologist. So we just went back to the classroom and sat down on our desks, and Mrs. Baird walked to the back of the classroom, and she picked up a piece of purple chalk, and she made a mark beside Wally's name. And as she was walking back down the aisle, she stopped in front of Wally's desk, and she said, Wally, I am so disappointed in you. She said, don't you think that Wonder Woman would be smart enough to park her jet on the roof? And 
And we were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Duh. Bet she didn't mean to give that away. But it got to be October. And this was back when we used to have a thing called winter. And um, it was too cold to play outside anymore. So we had to have recess inside. And putting ourselves in peril inside was a lot more difficult, short of like burning the school down. But none of us were quite that vested in finding out if Mrs. Baird was Wonder Woman. So our interest started to flag. We started to think about other things. There was a kid in our class who had a birthday and his parents hired a clown. And the clown had a helium tank and he, he blew up balloons for us. And then when the clown left, for whatever reason, he forgot his helium tank. And in the back corner of our classroom, there were two lockers, two big doorless cabinets. They're about eight feet tall, about eight feet across. They sat perpendicular to each other and the walls, made sort of a cube in the back of the classroom with a little doorway. We'd come in in the morning, put our jackets and our lunch boxes back there. And then anything we weren't using for the school year anymore got pushed behind those lockers. So like the Pinto, the Nina, and the Santa Maria, <laughs> that's my bilingual portion of the show, uh, we're sitting we're sitting behind those loggers. And then, and then, and then we were studying the human respiratory system. You ready? <laughs> and we learned all about the heart and the lungs and how when you inhale, the oxygen goes down your bronchus, which breaks into your bronchi, which breaks into smaller and smaller branches till it gets to the alveoli. The blood comes by, the carbon dioxide jumps out of your red blood cells into your alveoli, the oxygen jumps out of your alveoli into your red blood cells, you exhale. And that is how you breathe. So, and then, and then it was almost Halloween. And all of the students, we were going to get to wear our costumes to school. And we were going to trick or treat from classroom to classroom. And we were going to have a contest. Who had the scariest costume? Who had the funniest costume? Who had the best overall costume? But again, this was the 1970s. So we weren't all going to win. Some of us were going home with our self-esteem in a shoebox, and then we went into the arts. So, and then at the end of the day, we were going to go in the auditorium, and this had never happened before. The teachers were going to stand on stage, and the teachers were going to have costumes on, and we students were going to get to judge which teacher had the best costume. And this blew us away, because we were kids, and kids know that teachers are adults, and that adults are not creative. <laughs> and we thought, what are they gonna come dressed as? Is like the gym teacher gonna come dressed as the librarian? I mean, how exciting could this be? But better than all of that, our class was the best behaved class in the whole school. So our class was gonna get to watch a scary movie in our classroom, no other students there. The day arrived, 8.30. The bell rings. We're sitting in our desks. We have our costumes on. Football players, cheerleaders, doctors, nurses, lawyers, scuba divers, astronauts, other non-gender specific costumes. 8.30. <laughs> the bell rings. No Mrs. Baird. 8.35. No Mrs. Baird. 8.40. We were distraught. This was the single greatest day of our lives. We did not want to have a substitute teacher. Finally, at about 8.45, the classroom door opened up and Mrs. Baird came in. She was pushing a cart, and on top of the cart, there was a lump. And on top of the lump, there was a big piece of brown butcher paper. And Mrs. Baird said, come here, I want you guys to see something. And we got up and we gathered around that cart. And she said, you guys have done such a good job studying the human respiratory system that I have a surprise for you. And we were thinking, cupcakes. But she grabbed that piece of paper and she pulled it off that cart and underneath that piece of paper was a complete set of raw cow lungs. Still steaming from the butcher shop. And she reached under that cart and pulled out a spool of about 50 yards of surgical tubing. That's that clear hose you see in a fish tank. She cut off like a 12 inch straw. She said, I want you guys to see how lungs inflate and deflate. And she stuck that straw down into those lungs. She took a deep breath. She said, remember, only blow. <laughs> Don't suck. And then, 
And then she went, and it was amazing. Those lungs started to inflate. They started to expand. They were like, of course, they didn't really make that noise. That's just an illustration. If they really made that noise, all cows would go mad. And then she gave us each our own piece of tubing, and we each got to try and inflate those lungs. And I was tough. I was mean. I was macho. I was a fourth grader. I was three feet tall, weighed 26 pounds. I wasn't just going to make those lungs expand. I was going to make those lungs explode. So I took that tube. I stuck it down into those lungs. I took a deep breath. And those lungs were like, eh, eh. <laughs> Finally dawned on me that I had the lung capacity of a Dixie cup. So then, all the boys, we all got around at once. We all stuck our tubes down in there. We were all blowing as hard as we could. But we never could get those lungs to explode. So finally, that got boring. So we took those lungs, and we pushed them behind the lockers with the rest of the detritus from the school year. And we got ready to watch our scary movie. And the movie was The Blob. <laughs> Young people, if you ask your adult people about it, don't call it a movie. That will confuse them. Call it a picture show. <laughs> but what happens in The Blob is a meteorite crashes into Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. It cracks in half. Inside there's a blob. It's about the size of a volleyball. It looks like it's made out of red jello. It's kind of going, ee, 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 and it can roll like half a mile an hour. And yet it is able to chase down healthy adult human beings <laughs> running as fast as they can. And, and when it gets on you, it just consumes you. And the more people it eats, the bigger it gets. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, duh, it's a ball. Run uphill, shut the door, uh-uh, no. There's this one scene, there's a lady in a bathtub, but it is 1958, so there are a lot of bubbles. And uh, <laughs> she's in the bathtub, and the blob rolls up to the bathroom door, and we're like, she's cool, door shut, she'll be fine. And she's like, oh, this is so relaxing. And then the blob just goes, flattens itself out, starts to ooze under the door. And we're like, lady, watch out. And she's like, oh, this is just what I needed after a long week with those horrible children. And then the blob's getting closer. And we're like, lady, watch out. And then it's crawling up the side of the tub. And we're like, lady, watch out. And then boom, bam, gone. She's gone. It was horrible. It was terrifying. And if you were too scared to watch the movie, you could go and sit behind the lockers. But it was dark behind those lockers, and there was a complete set of raw cow lungs behind those lockers. Who knew when the ghost of that cow wasn't going to come looking for those lungs like moo? <laughs> the only person too scared to watch the movie but brave enough to sit behind the lockers was Alicia Snitch. <laughs> the rest of us were out there, and pretty soon the blob's as big as a beach ball, and then it's the size of a Volkswagen, and then it's like half the size of this tent, and they've called in the police, the state police, the National Guard, the Army, the Air Force, they're shooting pistols, rifles, rocket launchers, flamethrowers, nothing will stop the blob. And it's this actor named Steve McQueen against a gelatinous alien material. We don't know which one's smarter. And then, <laughs> and then the blob decides to move to the other side of town, and the people on the first side of town don't have the decency to pick up the phone and call the people on the other side of town, hey, just thought you might like to know, the blob is coming. So those people on that side of town, they don't know. They're all sitting in a movie theater. So now we're watching a movie about people watching a movie. And, and, and then in, in, the back, in the back of the movie theater, in the little, you know, little projector room, little rectile windows, uh, um, rectangular windows, uh, the blob. No. No, I edited out three jokes right there. No, so if we weren't live streaming. So anyway, the blob starts coming out of the rectangular shaped windows in the back uh, and, and it plops in, 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 into the balcony. And about this time, I could see something out of my peripheral vision, something out of the corner of my eye uh, was there, but it wasn't nearly as interesting as the movie. So I was watching the movie and the blob goes into the, into the balcony and 
sucks up a couple of people, and then it goes off the balcony into the main part of the theater, and pandemonium breaks out. People are getting up. They're running out all the doors at once, but by this time, the blob is so big, it can go out all the doors at once, just sucking people back in like an octopus. It was horrifying. It was terrifying, but I was tough. I was mean. I was macho. There's no way I was going to scream, and then <laughs> Wally. Wally was sitting next to me, and all of a sudden, Wally goes, And I was so embarrassed for him that I had to look. And when I looked, Wally was pointing. But Wally wasn't pointing at the movie screen. Wally was pointing above the lockers. And above the lockers, in our very own classroom, a great red, two-orbed, hissing, pulsating, expanding blob was rising up from behind the lockers. It had a long, bloody tentacle coming forth from behind it. The blob was in our classroom. <laughs> I was not macho anymore. I was like, mommy! I was running for the door. I was picking up smaller kids, throwing them at the blob. Eat him! Eat him! I'm not proud of that, but the blob, the blob beat us to the door. We couldn't get around it. And Mrs. Barry was standing there saying, calm down, calm down, we'll take care of this. And then we heard a scream, a long, loud, shrill, piercing scream. It came from behind the lockers. And when we turned to look, we saw Alicia rise up from behind the lockers. She was back there where the blob had come from, and the blob's long, bloody tentacle was wrapped around her, sucking her very life force out of her as the blob grew larger and larger. And Mrs. Barrett said, don't panic, I'll take care of this. And she grabbed the front of her dress. And she ripped it open. And underneath her dress was that one-piece patriotic bathing suit. <laughs> Can plead with the calf-high boots and the golden rope, and she got a tiara from somewhere. <laughs> and she threw it at the blob like a boomerang. And kaboom, the blob exploded, and we were shrouded in a fine, red, bovine mist. <laughs> As hunks of lung fell about the classroom, Alicia Snitch dropped with a thump behind the lockers, that long, bloody tentacle lay hissing on the ground. And then we followed Mrs. Baird, nay, we followed Wonder Woman <laughs> behind the lockers. And Wonder Woman picked up Alicia Snitch and unwound her from that long, bloody tentacle. And we saw where Alicia, in her deep and secret need to know whether or not Mrs. Baird was Wonder Woman, had taken that remaining surgical tubing and she'd shoved one end deep down into those cow lungs. She'd taken the other end and stuck it on that old helium tank that that clown had left. She turned that helium tank up all the way to create that giant long blob balloon to come and attack our classroom. And then Wonder Woman carried Alicia Snitch and put her in her desk. And then Wonder Woman walked to the back of the classroom, picked up that piece of purple chalk, and made a mark beside Alicia's name.